Segment 1. The Geography of Canada Before watching the Geography of Canada, think about this. How does the topography of Canada compare with the topography of the United States? Wide rolling plains checkered with farmlands, spectacular mountain ranges, rocky shorelines, and frozen tundra. These natural features define the landscape of one of the largest countries in the world, second only to Russia. This expansive land is Canada. Bordered by the Pacific Ocean to the west, the Arctic Ocean to the north, the Atlantic Ocean to the east, and the United States to the south, Canada spans two-fifths of the North American continent. Topographically, Canada is shaped like a giant basin with its lowest point around the Hudson Bay, a large inland sea in the center of the country, and mountains that run along the edges of its eastern and western sides. Canada is divided into 10 provinces and three territories. From east to west, the provinces are Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, Ontario, with Ottawa, Canada's capital, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia. The three territories in North Canada are the Yukon Territory, the Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. The same Rocky Mountains that run through the western United States extend into Canada to create a mountainous western terrain. Like the United States, flat grasslands, now the main farming region, cover the center of Canada. These are the interior plains. Waterways, both natural and man-made, are vital to Canada's economy. The Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway provide a passage for ships traveling from Lake Superior to the Atlantic Ocean. Much of Canada is uninhabited. About one-third is barren Arctic land. In this treeless area, temperatures stay below freezing most of the year. Most Canadians live in the more temperate southern part of the country. In fact, most of the population lives within 200 miles of the U.S. border. Major cities are Quebec City, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, and Vancouver, all in southern Canada. Climate and terrain, in large part, determined where these cities developed. The climate along Canada's southern border is milder than the frozen northern region of the country. Most of the big cities developed along rivers, lakes, and oceans. French settlers arrived in Canada in the 1600s but they handed over the land to Britain in 1763 after the French and Indian War. Canada's diverse population is 44% of British and 25% of French ancestry, with the balance consisting mostly of people from other European countries, as well as people of Asian and Native American descent. Canada is a bilingual country. Both French and English are official languages. In the north, Canada's climate is severe and the land is sparsely populated. But it's temperate and densely populated in the south. Visitors come to Canada to enjoy glacier-fed lakes and national parks but they also come to visit the cosmopolitan cities like Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. 
Canada covers a lot of ground, and that ground changes vastly between provinces. Covered in snow, ice, grain, or water, Canada covers millions of miles of diverse terrain. Now that you've seen the geography of Canada, talk about this. Why do most Canadians live in the southern part of the country? What influenced where the big cities of Canada developed? Segment 2, the Prairie Provinces. Before watching the Prairie Provinces, think about this. How do the plains of Canada support the people and the economy? Spreading throughout Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta is a wide expanse of level land where grazing cows and farmlands are common sites. This is Canada's farming heartland, the Canadian Plains. Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta together are called the Prairie Provinces. Large areas of these provinces are sparsely populated. Most people reside in Calgary and Edmonton in Alberta, Winnipeg in Manitoba, and Saskatoon and Regina in Saskatchewan. Like the United States Midwest, much of this land in the southern regions of the Prairie Provinces was once a grass-covered prairie, but today it is covered in farms. Wheat, sunflower seeds, corn, oats, and barley grow here. It's the main grain-producing region responsible for feeding millions of Canadians. In fact, over 90% of all the wheat grown in Canada is from the Prairie Provinces. Because wheat is used to make bread, this area is called Canada's bread basket. This is farming on a large scale. Most of these farms are corporately owned. Only 8% of Canada's land area is good for farming. The rest of the land area is too cold or the soil is too rocky. But in the Prairie Provinces, the soil is fertile and the area receives ample rainfall. These provinces are not without challenges though, especially when it comes to the weather. In some years, unusually warm temperatures in the plains areas increase the numbers of grasshoppers, flea beetles, and cutworms that feed on the crops. These creatures can destroy entire crops if they are not controlled. Farmers depend on cold winter temperatures to kill many of the insect eggs. When the winter's not cold enough, the insect population soars. Droughts, or periods of prolonged dryness, can seriously damage crops. Today, the Prairie Provinces are Canada's agricultural leaders. But they were once home to indigenous peoples and millions of buffalo that had lived there for centuries. The buffalo were nearly killed off after Europeans started arriving in Canada in the late 1800s. Hunting buffalo became a popular sport. After railroads were built, the numbers of people hunting buffalo for sport soared. Today, their numbers have risen, and the traditions of the indigenous peoples continue. Native Americans in Alberta dance the traditional dances, some of which celebrate the buffalo. While the Prairie Provinces are leading agricultural provinces, farmland occupies only the southern parts of the provinces. To the north are mixed forests of evergreen and deciduous trees, which shed their leaves in the winter. The natural resources of the Prairie Provinces have made them ideal for growing many crops, 
especially wheat. Saskatchewan alone produces two-thirds of Canada's wheat. Canadians and people around the world depend on the crops grown and livestock raised in these provinces. Now that you've seen the Prairie Provinces, talk about this. What challenges affect the Prairie Provinces' ability to produce food? Segment 3, British Columbia, Pacific Gateway. Before watching British Columbia Pacific Gateway, think about this. Why is British Columbia called the Gateway to the Pacific? At the westernmost edge of Canada, separated from the rest of the country by the Canadian Rockies, sits British Columbia. Bordered by Alberta to the east, the United States to the south, the Pacific Ocean to the west, and the Yukon and Northwest Territories to the north, British Columbia's location allowed it to quickly develop as a center for trade. Stretching inland from the rocky coastline, the landscape changes dramatically. More than half of the province is covered with forests. The abundant natural resources of British Columbia, wildlife, minerals, and timber, are what first attracted fur trappers, gold prospectors, and loggers. The creation of the Canadian Pacific Railway in 1885 transformed shipping in Canada. The city of Vancouver was westernmost, and it quickly became the leading center for industry and finance in British Columbia. It was well positioned as a port for ships sailing the Pacific. From here, goods were shipped to the rest of Canada. British Columbia is located on the Pacific Rim, which includes the countries in and along the Pacific Ocean. Most of Canada's trade with Asia and the Pacific Rim goes through Vancouver's port. British Columbia's coal fuels Japanese and South Korean steel mills. Forests, another important natural resource, cover over 50% of British Columbia. Lumber and paper products are a leading export. Warm breezes from the Pacific Ocean create a relatively mild climate in Vancouver. The water in the harbor never freezes, so ships can dock here all year long, even during the brutally cold winters that affect other parts of Canada. About a third of the total population of British Columbia lives in Vancouver. Many Asians live in Vancouver. Chinatown is a bustling part of the city, brimming with markets, restaurants, and shops. Asians account for only part of the cultural influence in Vancouver. You'll also find reminders of the indigenous people who lived here first. Totem poles are found throughout British Columbia and Canada. Carved out of trees and painted with symbols of animals or spirits, totem poles represent clans or families. British Columbia is a vital link in shipping and trade between Asia and Canada. The large Canadian city closest to Asia, Vancouver has become ethnically diverse. In many ways, British Columbia serves as not only a gateway to the Pacific, but as a meeting place between East and West. Now that you've seen British Columbia Pacific Gateway, talk about this. What is the relationship between British Columbia and many Pacific Rim countries? Segment 4, Cultures of the Atlantic Provinces. 
Before watching Cultures of the Atlantic Provinces, think about this. How has the location of the Atlantic Provinces influenced its culture? Northeastern Canada is divided into four relatively small provinces. Here, the winters are harsh and the waters are cold, and it helps if you like fish. These are Canada's Atlantic provinces, Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. They are also called the Maritime Provinces, a fitting name for a region where it's hard to escape the influence of the sea. Maritime refers to navigation or commerce on the sea. Fishing and shipping are major industries here. 75% of all the fish caught in Canada are from the Atlantic provinces. These provinces are bordered by the Atlantic Ocean, the Labrador Sea, and the Bay of Fundy. Vikings from Scandinavia landed on the coast of what is now Newfoundland around the year AD 1000. Today, few artifacts and buildings remain from those early Viking settlements. Hundreds of years after the Viking voyages across the Atlantic, European explorers discovered the rich natural resources here. The French were mainly interested in beaver fur, and they found plenty. They settled here and called this region Acadia. Ultimately, the British fought the French and won the lands that now comprise the Atlantic provinces. During the American Revolution, many British loyalists fled to Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and what is now called New Brunswick. Later, thousands of other Scottish and English people crossed the Atlantic Ocean to live here permanently. The British, Scottish, and Irish cultures are still the predominant influence in these provinces. In Newfoundland, approximately 95% of the population is of British origin. The types of food people eat, the sports and recreation, and even the weather are similar to those in the British Isles. When the English, Irish, and Scottish people settled in the Atlantic provinces, they found a land that felt a lot like home. It's no wonder their cultures remain strong here. Now that you've seen cultures of the Atlantic provinces, talk about this. Which countries have most influenced the culture of the Atlantic provinces, and how are their influences evident? Segment 5, Life in the Northern Territories. Before watching Life in the Northern Territories, think about this. What are the advantages and challenges of living in the harsh climate of the Northern Territories? More than a third of Canada is home to less than 1% of its population. This largely frozen land consists of Nunavut, the Northwest Territories, and the Yukon. Stretching across all of Canada, the territories are bordered by the Labrador Sea to the east, the Hudson Bay, the Prairie Provinces and British Columbia to the south, and the Arctic Ocean and Baffin Bay to the north. This is a region where only the brave survive. Much of the land here is tundra. This is a treeless plain in an Arctic region where little vegetation grows. Cold and dry, it is covered in snow most of the year. Parts of the soil remain frozen year-round. It's cold here even in the summer. In the winter, the lakes and rivers freeze and become roadways for cars. 
Just because the lake is frozen, it doesn't mean you can't go fishing. When the waters are frozen, people drill a hole in the ice to fish for whitefish and northern pike. In Yellowknife, the capital of the Northwest Territories, the average summer temperature is around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's an improvement over the winter temperatures that drop down to 60 degrees below zero. In the early spring, the people of Yellowknife put on a caribou carnival to celebrate the end of the long winter. Caribou, a species of reindeer, are highly valued here. Native Americans use caribou for food, clothing, and shelter. They travel in herds and prefer the coldest regions. At the Caribou Carnival, townspeople compete in sawing, tent building, snowshoe racing, and moose calling. Yellowknife is 900 miles from Edmonton, Alberta, the nearest big city. Today, the fastest way to get here is by plane. Yellowknife first attracted settlers in the early 1900s when gold was discovered. It still has the feeling of a frontier town. Here, the sky often puts on a spectacular show, the Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights, which seem to come straight from the realms of science fiction. These swirling bands of colorful light are thought to form when winds from the upper atmosphere mix with gases from Earth. Until 1999, Canada had only two territories, the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. The Canadian government split the Northwest Territories into two distinct territories by creating Nunavut on the eastern side. Life in Northern Canada is a challenge, and it helps if you know how to quickly light a fire, build a tent, and saw wood, the key elements to surviving this cold climate. Now that you've seen life in the Northern Territories, talk about this. How have people adapted to living in the harsh climate of Northern Canada? What natural resources do they use?